can introduce Ruthanna. Welcome everyone to our continuing education program this morning. I'm Marlene White, co-chairman with Perry Davis, and it is always our pleasure to provide you with interesting, informative, and educational programs. Today's program is entitled The Hebrew Language, presented by our esteemed guest speaker, Ruhama Danto, who always inspires us, always presents her topics with knowledge and compassion. And now I will introduce her. It is my honor, actually, to introduce Rahama. Rahama followed the family tradition in the education field. Along with her teaching career, she studied violin and art at the School of Art in Tel Aviv and graduated as a commercial artist. She produced a series of educational films, which are used in schools throughout Israel. In addition, she received her Bachelor of Science in the University of Tel Aviv. She is still a devoted member of the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. While as an exchange teacher at the, uh, in US, she obtained a master's degree in Bible at the Jewish Theological Seminary and a degree in art and stage design in New York. Rahama worked as a consultant to the Jewish Board of Education in Cleveland and taught at Associated Hebrew School in Toronto. Rahama was married to Cantor Louis Danto Oliver Shalom, who was a child survivor. They were both involved in Holocaust education and members of the executive of Yad Vashem. Rahama is presently lecturing in different organizations on Bible, art, Israel, and Judea. The floor is yours, Rahama. Welcome, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Everybody, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. You can hear me. Okay, and mute everybody, but not me. Uh, okay, so uh, can you show the flyer uh, uh, first? I thought that as an introduction to this presentation, I will explain its flyer. On the flyer of this presentation, we see a portion of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are in Hebrew, and include parts of the Bible. This uh, scroll are from thousand years BCE, which are before the destruction of the first temple, which was in 586 BCE. Number one. Number one, David. Now, the dead The Dead Sea Scrolls were found a, uh, in a clay jug by an Arab shepherd. Here we see the open scroll written in Hebrew. In order to show its authenticity, we see it here on the Bible. Both of them are open at the same verse in the book of Yeshayahu. 45.6. Yeah, can you make it a little bigger so they can see a, uh, on the scroll it's written and on the Bible. What's written there is the sentence, I am the Lord God, there is none else. Ki efes bil adai, you can see it in the Hebrew on the Bible there. Ki efes bil adai, ani Hashem ve'ein od. So the Dead Sea Scrolls were written in Hebrew about 3,000 years ago. How is it 3,000? We are now at 2021 and this was a thousand year BC. So it's about 3,000 years ago. Now, these scrolls were discovered at the caves of Qumran, number two. Yes, okay. 
Oh, no, Here we can see uh, uh, the cave of Qumran's and they, uh, we can see the Qumran caves. There are few caves there, right? You can see the holes in the caves. There are few of them. And those scrolls were found in one of them. The Arab shepherd took them to his family. They passed through different authority and they, at the end, they were bought by Israel. The Qumran caves are on the north western shore of the Dead Sea of Yama Melach in the Judea desert between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. Number three. Number three. Okay, uh, here we can see their location on this map. Uh, they are not, you will see the, the point here, oh, that's very good. Here is the Qumran Caves, and you see that it's not far from Jerusalem and very close to the Jordan River. So there are, yeah, very good. So this is uh, where it was found uh, uh, in this Qumran Cave. Uh, they are now a, um, so a, uh, it's interesting and important to know, so I repeat it, that they are about 3,000 years old. They are now kept in the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem. Now, it's very interesting that only a month ago, there were discovered 2,000 years old fragments uh, of another biblical scroll, which contained pieces of the biblical of the biblical books of Zechariah and Nahum, these were found in Murabaat Cave in Judea Desert. They were found in a basket, which is probably the oldest basket in the world. Uh, number four. Yes, uh, okay, you can see here the basket on the, uh, 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 where inside was, you see on the, uh, on the bottom, on the, close to the left, you see the basket. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, it looks like at that time, the scribers, the Sufrim, who wrote the Bible, kept the scroll in a safe place before we saw it in a jar, and here we see it in a basket. I don't know if you can see the basket here. So inside here were, were the scrolls. Uh, now, I think that maybe it's important uh, uh, just to, to mention, those scrolls were found there in a jar and here in the basket. But I want you to think, what did it take 3000 years ago to write those scrolls? Those scrolls are from a, a, a parchment, a cloth, just to prepare the cloth for the Torah and to use a special ink and to use a quilt like a feather to write it. I thought it's, it's interesting to know what it took 3000 years ago to write those scrolls. Uh, yeah, now you probably heard about this new, uh, 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 this new uh, um, uh, finding uh, because it was all over the news. I heard it uh, uh, 10 times a day. And they, um, it's probably heard, they, uh, uh, heard it to you. And now it's all, I want to say, it is not wonder that they found it. Actually, wherever you walk in Israel, you walk on history of thousands of years. As it's written in the beginning, of the book of Yahushua, just as Yahushua was about to cross the Jordan River to the, to the promised land with the people who came out from Egypt, God told him to Yahushua, every spot on which your foot treats, I will give it to you. Kol makom asher tidroch kaf raglechem bo, Lachem netativ, 
כאשר דיברתי עם משה. Now, why did I choose to show you these scrolls? Talking about the history of the Hebrew language, I thought that these scrolls, which are written in Hebrew, give us a little proof and are so old, give a little proof of how old is the Hebrew language. Now, why did I choose this subject? I think that it's important for everyone, but especially for us, the Jewish people, to know our entire and complete history, including our language. We are the only people in the world who speak the same language for over 4,000 years. And the road, the way to keep it alive all those years was not easy. I cannot talk now in this lecture about all the problems to keep it alive, but all the details that I will mention are very important. Now, what do you think? What makes sense to you? What preceded what, historically? Talking a language in a certain language or writing it? If these scrolls were written in Hebrew about 3,000 years ago, then it makes sense that Hebrew was a spoken language more than 3,000 years ago. So this brings us to the first part of, part of the title of this presentation, the history of the Hebrew language, which of course is very, very long one. So please be patient until I will get to the other parts of the title of this presentation uh, later. Uh, which are all fascinating to me anyways. So let's start. The origin of a language in the human species has been the topic of scholarly discussion for several centuries. I will be very general in this language since its topic could be a subject for a whole course. So first, how did the language start? There are three opinions about the origin of any language. Number one, an accepted, a recognized way. In Hebrew, Lashon Heskemit. Two, a natural way, Lashon Tivit. Three, a godly, or a holy one, Lashon HaKodesh. Number one, the accepted or the recognized one means that primitive people needed desperately to communicate with each other, to warn them from a danger, to express their needs, their passion, their feelings. So, they somehow agreed upon certain kind of sounds, enunciation, diction, or tones, and from this developed a specific language. This gestural or phonology theory states that human language developed from gesture, hint, signals that were used for simple communication which means the language developed from the decision of human being. And by the way, this is the opinion of the Rambam, which is mentioned in the Guide of the Perplexed in Moren Evochim. Uh, number two, the natural way, Lashon Tivit, means that the language was created as a result of different characters different personalities, different societies and culture development, mental temper, and even different climates. 
which also means that it developed from decision of human being. Number three, the godly, the holy one, Lashon HaKodesh, means that language came from God. He created it, and human being got it from him. Now, as I said, the Rambam theory about the origin of all languages is human. It was accepted and recognized through gestures, and it was decided and agreed by human. Rabbi Yehuda Levi and also Abarbanel and Ramban agreed with this opinion about all the languages except the Hebrew one. The Hebrew language, in their opinion, the origin of the Hebrew language is the third one, that the origin of the Hebrew language is from the divine. It's godly. And that's why it's also called the Shona Kodesh, the language of holiness. Let's see what we can learn about it from the Bible. And I will grow chronologically from the creation of the world, which was in 5,781 years ago. Uh, the reason that I, uh, that I chose to go uh, chronologically about the stories of the Bible is to prove that Hebrew was a talking language in all the biblical period. When God created the world, he created it by talking, by word. As we mention every day in our prayers, Baruch She'amar, the Olam. We don't always think what it means. It means blessed be he who spoke, he said, and the world came into being. As we see, we read in Genesis, a uh, yeah, first chapter, and God said that let there be light. Vayomer Elohim, Yehi Or. He did not say it in Aramaic. He did not say it in Greek. He commanded it in Hebrew. Or God said, let there be permanent uh, um, uh, uh, in the middle of the water. Vayomer Elohim. Yehi rakia betoch hamayim. And we all know the blessing we say when we eat something. Baruch atah Hashem shehakol nihiya bidvaro. What does it mean? Everything is done through his word, bidvaro, but varim shawamar. We never think about this meaning. By the way, I mentioned Vayomer Elokim, Vayomer, 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 but Vayomer, he said, is not the only verb for talking in the Bible. There are different expressions in the Bible for talking, like Vayikra, Vayetzav, commanded, Vayedaber, Vayishal, Vayaged, like it's written, Vehigadeta lebincha, tell your son, like we said in the Haggadah, uh, tell your children. So there are different ways uh, about the talking in the Bible. Later in chapter one in Genesis, uh, verse 26, God said, let's create Adam. Vayomer Elohim, naase Adam. And in chapter 2, uh, 7, we read that he created Adam from the dust of the earth. In Hebrew, Adama. Vayitzer Hashem Elohim et Adam, afar min ha'adama. So the name Adam is from the Hebrew word Adama. Now, when God created Adam, he spoke to him. He commanded him saying, you may eat all you like from every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, 
you may know it. Uh, yeah, so indicating and signifying that God spoke to Adam a language which Adam understood. God provided Adam a language when he created him. And this language came from God himself, not through development of sound or moan or signals or gestures. And this language, as we saw, was clearly Hebrew. This is the same language which Adam also spoke to his wife. How do we know that? We see evidence that Adam spoke Hebrew because he gave Eve two names. Each one of them makes sense only in Hebrew. He called her Isha, woman, because she was taken from Ish, men. Vayomer ha'adam, lazot ikare Isha, ki me'ish lukha. And he called her Chava, because she was the mother of Em Kol Chai, of everybody. Adam also used this language when he gave name to all the creatures which God created. God brought in front of Adam all the animals and all the creatures, and he told him to call them names. And Adam gave names, as it's written in Genesis 2, 16, and 19 and 20. And I quote, and Adam gave names to all the animals. And whatever he called them remained their names. So all the Hebrew names of animals, which we know today, were given by Adam. So... So far, God created the world by words, which makes sense that it was Hebrew. God spoke Hebrew to Adam and Eve, in Hebrew, of course, and though, so did Adam and Eve spoke between them. God also spoke to Noah when he told him to build the ark in order to prepare him to the flood. As we read, and God said to Noah, make an art. Vayomer Elohim el Noach, aselech ha'teiva. So God spoke to him also in Hebrew when he instructed him about the animals he should bring into the ark. And Noah understood what God told him to do. As we read in verse 22, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him. Vayas Noah, kechol asher tzivauto elokim, ken asa. Number five. Now, according uh, to all the commentators, the flood uh, was in Mesopotamia. This whole area along and between the two rivers, if you can see here the two rivers, the Prat and Hidekel, the Euphrates and Tigris. You can show them, uh, Rabbi David, where the two rivers are. Uh, there, that uh, yeah, in between the two rivers, yeah, thank you. Uh, and along those rivers, there was flood. The, uh, and, uh, and it all flooded. After the flood, when the water subsided, the ark landed on the mountain of Ararat, which is now in Turkey. According to the Bible, after the flood, Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yefet, who all spoke, of course, Hebrew, spread all over the world. But then we have in the Bible, the story of the building of the Tower of Babel, which was in Shinar in the south of Mesopotamia. So from the time of Adam and Eve until the generation 
of the Tower of Babel by the descendant of Noah who survived the flood, we read that everyone spoke the same language. Uh, I thought that they, uh, I will, uh, uh, it will be, no, I wait a minute. Uh, so the question is, that uh, uh, from Adam until the generation of the Tower of Babel, uh, everyone was speaking one language, that everybody spoke prior and in the same of the, uh, of the time of the building of the Tower of Babel. They all spoke one language. Uh, number six, uh, I thought I will show you uh, yes, if you can uh, yeah, also make it a bit larger. I thought I will show you a, uh, this uh, famous picture uh, of the Tower of Babel. Uh, it was done by the Dutch artist uh, Peter uh, Gru uh, Bruegel. Uh, as we read in chapter 11, the people planned to build a tower which will reach the sky. We can still see in this picture that they did manage to get up to the clouds, you see on the top of it. So they did manage to build it a, um, a, um, already very, very far up by the clouds. A, uh, now, as we hear, a, uh, the, the, they spoke all one language. The question is, what was the language that they spoke? The one language that everybody spoke prior and at the time of the building of the Tower of Babel. Of course, this language was Hebrew, the same language that the previous generation, Noah descendant who survived the flood, the flood spoke. So it's mentioned in the Bible, all the people who tried to build the Tower of Babel spoke one language. And I quote in Genesis 11, everyone on earth and had the same language and the same word. Vayehi kol ha'aretz safa achat udvarim achadim. So, a, uh, a, as a matter of fact, in the Bible, God said, because they all have one language, this makes them very united and very strong. I want you to listen to this pasuk. If we all speak one language, all of us, not only from Babel, it makes us stronger. We can do everything if we all have the same language. And that's what God said about the people who try to build the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the tower of Babel. So uh, this is uh, a... Um, Uh, this bold and arrogant deed to build a tower and a city which will reach heaven and control the world, so to speak, displeased God. And God, what did he do? He confused their language. The one language that they all spoke and everybody spoke then, the Hebrew language. And I got, and, and I quote, God said, let's confuse their language so they would not understand each other and they would not be able to build this tower. Vayomer Hashem, nerda venavla etzfatam, asher lo ishmeu ish etzfat reeu. So, God confused their language and they could not communicate with each other, and they could not, of course, continue to build the tower. And then God scattered them all over the world. It would appear that after the Tower of Babel, which the descendant of Noah tried to build, and God confused their one language, they were all over the earth, with their different languages. The descendant of Yefet traveled north with their language. The, defend, the descendant of Ham 
traveled south, southwest with their language. And the descendant of Shem traveled west with their language, which was Hebrew. How come the Shem's language remained their original language, Hebrew? It is reasonably to believe that Shem's language was not affected when God confused the language of the people who tried to build the Tower of Babel, which will reach uh, the sky. Uh, before it, it did not uh, it, it, uh, did not uh, affect it because of the prophetic blessing Noah gave to Shem in God's name. In Genesis 9, 26, we read, Bless be the Lord, the eternal God of Shem. Vayomer Noach, Baruch Hashem, Elokei Shem. So, only Shem's language remains the same as it had been previously. The one language that had existed from Adam onward, the Hebrew language. Now, why, uh, why Hebrew is classified as a Semitic language from Shem, the son of Noah? This would, be, uh, would mean that the language that eventually came to be the Hebrew language, the Semitic language, was the one original tongue of mankind. Now, let's continue chronologically with Noah's descendant, Abraham, who was a descendant of Noah, son of Shem. Now, how is Abraham called in the Bible? In the Bible, he called Abraham Ha'ivri. Number seven. What does it mean in Hebrew, Ha'ivri? It comes from the word La'avor, to cross over. In order to come to Canaan, today Israel, Abraham had to cross over from Mesopotamia, which today is Iraq. When God told him in Hebrew, in Ur, we can see where Ur is, a, uh, down there in the, um, yes, it's mentioned Ur. Can you see Rabbi David? Yes. Uh, when God told him in Hebrew, Lech Lecha, he had to cross from the other side to come to Canaan. But of course, he couldn't go straight to Israel because it was desert. So he went along the rivers up to Haran in the north, and then he went down to Israel. He went along the river. This was the right way to go, where there is water. Uh, so he understood uh, when, when, he, uh, when God told him in Hebrew, Lech Lecha, and he went. He did what God told him. Now, to continue, Abraham and his son Isaac stayed in the land Eya, which was promised and given to them and their descendant. And all the conversation between them, thank you, this is enough. Uh, all the conversation between them was the one language they knew, the Hebrew language. Yaakov, the next generation, went down to Egypt and he was there with the Israelite for 210 years. Now, this is interesting. The Midrash tells us that one of the reasons the Israelites were freed from Egypt is because they did not forget their language and their names. They stayed connected to the Hebrew language. How do we know that? Let's look at Yosef's children. What are the names of the families there? Yosef's children are Menashe and Ephraim, which makes sense only in Hebrew. What does it mean, Menashe? For God, a, a, a Nashani Elohim et kol Amali. For God made me forget 
all my toil. אין אפרים, כי הפרני אלוקים בארץ עוניי. For God had made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now, and this is very interesting. In the story of the Israelite, when the, uh, the story of the Israelite in Egypt, the Bible is using the word Ivri in their life in Egypt. Not Israelites, but Ivrim. For instance, in Exodus 2, in the story about Moshe in the Teva, when Paro's daughter saw the baby, she said, Mi al dei ha'ivrim hu ze. This must be from the children of the Ivrim. And in Exodus 2, 11, Moshe saw, Ish Yitzri make Ish Ivri. An Egyptian is beating a Hebrew man. And in Exodus 2, 13, Moshe saw, Shnei anashim Ivrim nitzim. Two Hebrews are fighting. So Hebrew, Ivrit, was the language of Abraham descendant in Egypt for 210 years. Now, and this is so important, in the Exodus from Egypt, which was 1290 BCE, when the Ivrim left Egypt, Egypt and arrived to Mount Sinai, God spoke to all of them and all of them heard God's voice. They heard all the Ten Commandments from God. In what language did God say the Ten Commandments to them? That's the language that they also saw written on the two tablets. They heard and saw the Hebrew language, Leshon HaKodesh, the holy language, the same language that God created the world. So we understand why Hebrew is called Leshon HaKodesh, the language of holiness, the holy language, as it was called in the Talmud in Masechet Sotah. Now, how does a language possess holiness? The reason for calling Hebrew Lashon HaKodesh is that it was used by God from the creation of the world and in the land of Israel since it is, was conquered by Yoshua through the time of the judges, Shoftim, and the kings, Melachim, all this time in the Bible, until the end of the book of Melachim, they all spoke Hebrew, until the destruction of the second temple and the exile on the year 70 of the common era. Now, the big and important question is what happened to the Hebrew language in exile? after they went to exile on 70 of the coming era, when, it, when they were out of Israel, like here in Canada, what happened to the Hebrew language? The Hebrew was kept in the exile, but not as a spoken language, only as a traditional one. In every country throughout the world, Jews, Read, read the Torah, prayed, and say different blessings in Hebrew. The children can go to a Hebrew school, and they, and they, uh, and they try to, to learn Hebrew. But had to, all of them had to speak the language of the country that they lived in. We are here in Canada, we have to speak English. But, so it was kept, but not as a spoken language, only as a traditional. Prayer in Hebrew serves as a constant and universal bond and united the Jewish people who were desperate, uh, dispersed 
to all the corner for, uh, uh, corners of the world, speaking in 70 different languages. If you visit Mexico or Japan and you go to a synagogue there, you will feel very comfortable to pray in the familiar prayers that you know in Hebrew. So Hebrew is for us, not for God. Prayer in Hebrew are needed not in order to make our world better understanding by God, but the reverse, the opposite, to make the word of God better understood by us. So Hebrew again is for us, not for God. This is my sister from Israel, but I'm not going to answer. A, uh, a, so the historian uh, Frankel said, Hebrew is the historical chain which links all the, dis the, the uh, dispersed part of our people into one national body. Without it, we destroy our national unity and become stranger to all other Jews. And as Peretz Molanski, a scholar, lived at about the 1900, said, Hebrew is the force which unites the Jewish successive generations. We in the diaspora, we do not have a solid a ground and no authority. We have one treasure, and this is the holy language. Now, and I think this is interesting. It's interesting to know, to know a few words about the concept holy tongue, Sfat HaKodesh. What does holy mean? Holy means different, separate, elevated spiritually. Shabbat is called Shabbat Kodesh. It's different than the rest of the days of the week. Eretz Israel is Eretz HaKodesh. It's different than all the other countries. The people of Israel are Am Kadosh. They are different than the world, than, than the rest of the world of the nations in the world. In, as it's written in Parashat Kedoshim, God said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, is a holy. Kedoshim ti you. God is holy. He is different than other gods. So going back to the diaspora, whoever rejects, listen to this, or forget this language, the Hebrew language, reject, reject the entire Jewish people. Hebrew is dispensable. It's vital for the sake of the Jewish people, for the sake of the Torah, for the sake of the Hebrew itself. Vital for the sake of the people. How? As I mentioned, the Jewish people who are dis uh, dispersed in the four corners of the world, speaking in uh, 70 uh, different languages, prayers in Hebrew serve as a constant and universal bond enhancing the people's sense of oneness. Vital for the sake of the Torah, how? Hebrew is the language of both, the people of Israel and the Torah of Israel. A language is much more than an instrument of communication. A language is best expressed in its original language. No translation, can ever adequately re uh, render the full meaning and beauty of a concept in the original one. Now vital for the sake of Hebrew, how? The sages insisted uh, on prayers in Hebrew, not so much for the sake of prayer, but rather more for the sake of Hebrew, for guarding and fostering the Hebrew language so that it should be not forgotten. And thus, a, a preser a preserving and maintaining the integrity and purity of both, 
the people of, the, of Israel and the Torah of Israel. Jewish law requires that prayers should be meaningful. And they should be a, 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 the integrity and purity. Just a second, no, I'm sorry. Uh, that the prayer should be meaningful and expressed with a kavanah, with intention and feelings. If one doesn't understand well Hebrew and is not moved with the Hebrew word in that fila, and they are meaningless to him, by all means, let him pray in any language that he understand. God will understand him in any language. But he must, however, know and keep in mind that much is lost in the translation. Now, as I said, in the diaspora, Hebrew was not a spoken language until Eliezer ben Yehuda in the 1900, who revived the Hebrew language to a spoken one, not only to a traditional one. It was in the beginning of the Zionist movement, Eliezer ben Yehuda, who was born in Lita, succeeded to bring back the Hebrew language to life. And few years later, it became, of course, the formal and the official language of the state of Israel. How did Eliezer ben Yehuda do it? It was very, he was very dedicated to the Hebrew language. And he created, this is fascinating to me, he created new words that were needed in his time based on the biblical ones. Isn't it something? Just think about it. And I will bring you a few examples. When God created Adam, it written that he created him in his image. Elokim et Adam betsalmo. Betselem Elokim barauto. So the, from the word betselem, in his image, he created the word matzlema, camera. And from this, of course, a whole group of words and, and, and verbs from this, the same root. Salam is a photographer. Tzilum is a photography. Letzalem is to, to photograph. So from this Betzelem Elokim Barautam, he created the camera, which is absolutely amazing. Another one, he invented the word Atzma'ut, independent. How did he mention it? It comes from the word etzem. Adam uh, uh, said after the creation of the woman that she is part of him, a bone of my bones. Etzem me'atzamai. What is the connection between atzma'ut, independent, and etzem, bone? Etzem, bone, is solid strong, stabilizing part of the body. Adam, a, uh, in his first chapter of, in the first chapter of a, uh, uh, Exodus also, and in the, in the first chapter of Exodus, uh, Exodus verse seven, we read, and the people of Israel were fruitful in Egypt and became exceedingly mighty. How is it written in Hebrew? Bnei Israel in Egypt, Again, from the same word, etzem, because etzem is so, is so strong. So, and so is atzma'ut, strong, independent, mighty. And that's what we call the uh, Yom Atzma'ut, uh, our Independence Day, a day to celebrate our strength and our might. My third example of how Eliezer ben Yehuda made the word from Bible to create a new word which was needed in our time. The word, it's amazing, is chashmal. It looks like the word chashmal was used in Hebrew for electricity forever. Where did it come from? The word chashmal is written only one time in the Bible in the book of Yechezkel, chapter one, four, 
when God revealed himself to Yerkeskel in one of the most astounding vision in the Bible. Yerkeskel said, I looked and the stormy wind came sweeping, a huge cloud fascinating fire and the center of it a gleam, a sparkle, a glow of Hashmal. None of the commentator know exactly what did Yechezkel uh, saw. Because uh, uh, as I said, this is the only time this word is mentioned in the Bible. But when a word for electricity was needed in modern Hebrew, it was clear that this word, Hashmal, captured precisely the modern power of electricity. Now, just one more uh, 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 thing that Eliezer ben Yehuda uh, uh, invented is from the word Shabbat, the rest day, ben Yehuda invented the word Shvita. What is Shvita? A labor strike. Same Shoresh, same root as Shabbat. Of course, these are only few examples of Eliezer ben Yehuda, a, um, a new additions to the Hebrew language based on the Bible. So Hebrew is a fascinating language that has a dynamic past and now enjoys rebirth in the modern of Israel. So I spoke about the history, the survival and the revival of the Hebrew language. I will go now to the uniqueness of this amazing language, its character, form and shape as we know it now. There is no other language in the world like the fascinating of the Hebrew language. First, what is the, the Hebrew word for language? Safa, Safa, from Sfatayim, lips, a Safa Ivrit, or Lashon, uh, meaning tongue. Both of them are used to talk. Lashon and Safa. Now, just a second. Uh, now, see, uh, now something uh, that is specific only in Hebrew. Hebrew is the only language which every word has a root, Shoresh. The root is composed of three letters. If we don't understand the word in Hebrew, we look at his root and then we can find tens of words from the same root and we can find the one that we are looking for. For example, uh, I will start with the first, Rabbi David, get ready. I will start with the first word in the Bible, Bereshit. What is the meaning of, a, 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 of Bereshit? In the beginning or in the heading? Both. What is the root? Look at the word Bereshit. The root is Reish Aleph Shin, which means Rosh, head. Head is not only the top of the body, it is the center of the intellect, of human wisdom and judgment, and therefore, and therefore the core of, of human identity, of human similarity. So the Bible message is that God's creation of heaven and earth is an intelligent, clever, a, a intentional process, not a random not in a casual uh, act. As we can say about a smart person, he has a good head, Rosh, yes, or even in Yiddish, he wrote a cop, the cop arbet, doesn't matter the body, but Rosh is really, a, uh, so it's also the, uh, the heading. And from this, uh, so we can say uh, the, about a, a smart person, that he has a good head, as we use it for Rosh HaYeshiva, the head of the academy, or Rosh HaYir, the mayor, or Rosh HaMemshala, the head of the government, Yoshev Rosh HaKneset. 
And we say also in Psalm, אם אשכחך ירושלים, תשכח ימיני, אם לא אעלה את ירושלים על ראש שמחתי. If I forget you out Jerusalem, if I said not Jerusalem above my chiefest joy. And many more words from that word, from that root. In English too, we are using the word head, not only as part of our body, but also as prime, prime minister, or like the head waiter or headmaster. And as I mentioned, Bereshit means also beginning with the root of Rosh. From this we have, uh, thank you, that's not, uh, uh, from this we have Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, or Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the month. So it's also the beginning and it's also a, uh, the, uh, the value and the, uh, uh, of it. Uh, yeah, now I mentioned now Rosh Chodesh in connection of the word Rosh, beginning. What about the second word, Chodesh? Chodesh in Hebrew means month. Where does this come from? From the root Chet, Daled, Resh. From this root, we also have the word New, Chadash, New. So what, what new? New what? In, in, in the word Chadash, Chodesh. What is the connection between Chodesh, month, and Chadash, new? Every month is a renewal. A renewal of what? A renewal of the moon, number nine. We know that our calendar is according to the moon, to the lunar, and not the solar, the, the solar one. We know uh, 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 that uh, uh, the, in the middle of the month, the moon is full. And then it's little by little, and there we see here the middle of the month, it's full. So it's a renewal every month, it's a renewal of the moon. One more example for this root, Chet Dalet Shin, uh, is when you wear something new, we say in Hebrew, Titchadesh. What does it mean, Titchadesh? Uh, yeah, enjoy your new clothing uh, yeah, or what. So uh, yeah, from this root, Chet Dalet Shin, there is a whole group of words. I want to bring now a, a few more examples be, be, uh, be, because uh, the whole concept of root is so unique in the Hebrew language and help to understand almost every word. So another example is the word tzedakah, which means charity. What is the root of tzedakah? Tzadik, daled, kuf. So we can understand many words from this root, like tzadik, a pious, tzodek is correct, is right, or tzedek, justice, like justic, justice you shall pursue. So it's again, few words from the same shoresh. It's really an amazing language. There is no language like this. Now, an interesting, a, a very interesting a, a, and fascinating example a, a, is the root. This is really fascinating. The root of the word ha'azinu. We have a parashat ha'azinu. What does it mean, ha'azinu? Listen. With ozen, the root is aleph, zayin, nun, from ozen. Uh, 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 since this is the part of the body that we can hear with. But it is much more than that. We all know that our ears keeps our balance. That's why a scale in Hebrew is moznaim. Within it, you can find the root, ozen, moznaim. And le'azen means to keep things even in the same scale. Another meaning, a, uh, another interesting example is the name, a, uh, 
uh, is the name of a tree that we are all familiar with, the Shkediya, as we sing in on Tu Bishvat. Since this is the first tree which becomes, which blooms after the winter in Israel, this tree and its fruits, Shkedim, almonds, Shkedim, and its branches are mentioned many, many times in the Bible. But I will mention one important, and this is Aharon Rads, Aharon's Rad, that budded and blossoms and bore right almonds in the book of Numbers 17, 23. And by the way, this Rad was kept always in the ark in the temple together with the two tablets and the golden pot that had the manna. I hope you know this, that in the Kodesh HaKodeshim, in the ark were three things, the two tablets, and the broken one, and the golden pot of the manna and a haron rod, which was blooming with the shkedim. From this root, we have also the verb lishkod, which applies to God, to a person, to a student who work with preserve uh, with perseverance, preserve, with uh, diligence, who shakdan, a bachor aze, a student aze, who shakdan. He, uh, he really studies well and he does his work well. My last example will be the word matzpen. Matzpen, which is a, uh, a, a campus. Ben Yehuda, it's Ben Yehuda's idea uh, to, uh, for the campus, the device that point north. Of course, Ben Yehuda got, a, uh, got it from the word tzafon, north in Hebrew. And so are many more. Anyway, we've got the idea. Now, few words about the Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew letters, which are also very unique. Uh, first, the word letter, ot, in Hebrew, means also symbol, sign, signal, hint, clue. Second, Hebrew is the only language which each of the letters have a meaning. It's not like A, B, C, D. What does it mean? Nothing. In Hebrew, each letter has a meaning. Of course, I will not go now about all the Hebrew letters, but I will bring a few examples. Aleph, the first letter, a, uh, a, and they uh, used metaphor as the first in its value. That's why a brigadier general, the head of his group in the Israeli army, is called Aluf. So it's first in the value, not only first of the alphabet. So Aluf. And from this root is Le'alef. Le'alef means to train, to teach. And Ulpan in Hebrew means a school which teach Hebrew. The letter bet, among the rest, the letter bet is in, b, like I was in the house, ba, bait, in the store, ba, chanut. And, a, uh, and this is also a, um, a like a ba is like also for bet, bait. And from this, we have bait hasefer, bait akneset, bait merkachat for, prof, for a pharmacy or Beit Din, courthouse. The letter Gimal, as a verb, is Ligmol, means to compensate, to repay, to restore. Uh, doing good things without expecting any repay. That's from, from Gimal Mem Lamed, or Birkat Gomel. We know that we are thankful to God, we bless God, and uh, for protecting us from, gen uh, from, from a uh, danger. Why, uh, one more example from the alphabet is the Dalet. Uh, the word Hebrew, Dalet, when you hear Dalet, what comes to your mind? Dalet, door. The way it's written, 
it's like open in two sides, it's one, two, and opens in the other two sides. A, uh, a, some commentators say that in the word Dalet, we have the word Dal, Dalet Lamed, which means poor. Then the door is open for the poor in two sides. So the poor can come, they are opening for the poor. So are the rest of the Hebrew letters, which it, each one of them has a meaning. Now, talking about the Hebrew letters, I would like to mention something here uh, that is in the first sentence of the Bible. We read in the first sentence, Bereshit bara elokim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. Why isn't it written, Bereshit bara elokim shamayim ve'aretz? Why is the word et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz? Because as I mentioned, God created the world and everything on it by word, by talking. As I mentioned before, the blessing before, a, before we eat, hakol nihiya bidvaro. So et in Hebrew, aleph, taf, are the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. When God created the world, he created the Hebrew alphabet from Aleph to Taf, using all the letters with, uh, yeah, with which God used to create the world. Now, when people speak English, they often speak Hebrew and they don't even know about it. They don't even realize it. There is a whole collection of words which entered the English language directly from the Hebrew language, and I will mention only some of them. First, let's take the word, uh, 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 the, uh, first let's take instant names first. Uh, when his mother called Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin, she was talking Hebrew, ben Yamin. Or when we call somebody Yosef, from Lehosif, as it's written, or Yaakov, from Akev, or Natan, to give, or Dan, to judge, and more. All those are meaning only in Hebrew, not in any other. And, and also, every single bi a biblical name has a meaning, especially when the name starts or finished with El, Aleph Lamed, which means God. Like a... Uh, you are talking Hebrew when you say Daniel, Emmanuel, Samuel, Ishmael, Michael, uh, or even David, which means beloved. For example, when El is, is in the beginning, uh, I said before that it's on the end, it also can come in the beginning, like Eliyahu, Elisha, Elisheva for a girl, Eliana, actually, Rabbi Schneider's daughter, Eliana. Each one of these names meaning only in Hebrew, not in any other language. As I mentioned, it's interesting that many languages are using Hebrew, Hebrew word without knowing that it came from Hebrew. For instance, the powerful word, small word, Amen, which, uh, yeah, by the way, is related to the word Emunah which means faith. When a person say this word, he commits himself to agreement, judgment and faith. What is so amazing uh, in, that, in that, that this one small water is universal and recognized all over the world in many languages. And not many know that its original is in Hebrew. Same is the word hallelujah that everybody is using. And it's a, it comes from Hebrew. Or Messiah from Mashiach. Or Jubilee from Yovel. Or Satan from Satan. Or Camel from Gamal. Or Map from Mapa. Or even Alphabet. It comes from Alphabet. 
and other people are using it. Or Adam and many more. So to summarize, so the, uh, the first amazing, first it's amazing uh, uh, that the Jewish people are the only people in the world who are speaking the same language since the creation of the world, as we could see. Until today, from the creation of the world until today, there is no nation today who speaks language, uh, languages of the biblical time. Nobody speaks today Akkadit or Shumerit or Aramaic. Not only this, and number 10, Rabbi, right now, uh, so not only this, it is, it is interesting to mention that Israel is the only country in the world that bears the same name, that speaks the same language, that holds the same faith, the same religion, and that became a, uh, a and that lives in the same land for 3,000 years. Thank you. Thank you, Ruchama. Once again, really inspiring discussion on the Hebrew language and uh, gave me a lot of insight into a lot of things that you kind of accept. With, without really knowing unless you've studied the language as thoroughly as you have to uh, you know the roots of a lot of words that we, we, we speak while we duck while we're davening or, or just in conversation and uh, once again very impressed with all the research that you've done to put this together and um, I, 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 there's a lot for us to take away from this uh, wonderful lecture so thank you very much for everything that you've done. And uh, thank you to everybody who's come and participated. Now, I've got a few uh, questions here for you. So why don't we get into those and uh, get, you can uh, inspire us a little bit more. Um, one question is, why do we write and read Hebrew from right to left? <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> and this is, the way, this is the way that it was written in those scrolls also. So it looks like this was the tradition. It's a, um, a by the way, there are other languages, a, uh, Arabic also is from right to left. So maybe it's a, um, uh, but, uh, but this is the way those scrolls from 3000 years ago uh, was written. Okay. Um... Okay, how did the Hebrew language, Ivrit in Hebrew, become Hebrew in English? Uh, well, I think that they took it exactly uh, like the uh, like the the Egyptian, a um, from laavor from a cross, a uh, Ivrit uh, when they, um, when Abraham had to cross from Ur to Israel. So laavor. Ivrit is from this also, and uh, this is how in Egypt they were called because the people came from also from the other side into Egypt, and they were called Ivrim. Okay. Um, so the question above. Where? Uh, let's see where else. Yeah, okay, just ask for that one. That one. Yeah. Um, did you do that one? Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. That was it. I think uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls did not date from 3,000 years ago. Earliest ones were from 250 BCE. Was that uh, a correction on... Uh, your information? What, what is it again? 
it says the Dead Sea Scrolls did not date from 3,000 years ago. Early well, well, we do, we, we make 3,000. A, um, um, uh, uh, this is the archaeologist uh, yeah, found out when we say 3,000 uh, in general, uh, we say 3,000, we, um, we, we, uh, about a, um, they were 1,000 uh, thousand BCE. And we are now in 2000. So it's 3000 years ago. Okay. Understand what I said? Uh, I said that the, that the scrolls were from 1000 BCE. We are now in 2000 of the common era. So altogether it's 3000 years ago. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so from the time that they were actually found, there's that uh, period of time. A little bit right now, more, we are 2020, and this is a, yeah, so it's, yes. Right, right, okay. Um, I just, just curious, when you said Eliezer ben Yehuda updated the Hebrew language, is there any idea just how many words? Oh, I want to tell you a lot. As a matter of fact, I want to show you something. I have here a dictionary of Eliezer ben Yehuda. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you can see. Uh -huh. Yeah. So in here, it's a Hebrew English dictionary, but most of the words are his. He did a marvelous, marvelous job. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it's interesting. Uh, uh, I, I met and I was friendly. I didn't see her for a long time. His granddaughter, her name is Eliezer, on his name, Eliezer Ben Yehuda. And I met her one time in Florida and we became friendly. But, they, uh, but it's very interesting. He, he cared so much that, they, uh, that he put all his effort and all his to, to create. And as I said, mainly what he needed is, a, is Hebrew for today based on the Bible. We are not talking uh, Hebrew in a, in a biblical uh, 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 language. We are talking a, Hebrew, a modern Hebrew. And most of it uh, uh, were renewed, you know, uh, uh, and many of them right now, I'm sorry to say uh, that in Israel, some people are killing the language and they, uh, they, they bring in all kinds of uh, uh, half words and half, I don't know. But uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda was very specific uh, um, uh, on, the, uh, to, on the base of certain words in the Bible. He found, like, I'm f so amazed with a, with a Tselem and Matzlema. It's amazing, a Tselem Elohim, a camera to do a, uh, or things like this. So, Gary. There's someone has their hand up. Yeah, oh. Rose. Uh, <laughs> okay. We have. There is that reaction. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, I, hi, how are you doing? I, hi, Ruchameli. Hi, Ruchameli. This was absolutely ingenious, amazing, insightful, and I thank you very much. I'm so happy that you are here. I want to <laughs> let the people know this girl and her husband are from London, Ontario. And, they, uh, and yeah. I'm listening a lot to their lectures, and uh, which are also I enjoy it all the time. So it's really nice to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we, love, we love you, Ruhama. I just want to mention about Eliezer ben Yehuda and uh, maybe a connection to Shavuot and to some other things. Sometimes when someone is trying to change something or add something or make something happen, Sometimes the people, the folks, speak, and it doesn't work. Eliezer ben Yehuda really did not want us to speak Polish or Yiddish or Russian. So he came up, like Ruhama said, with many words that he felt should be the substitute for whatever other language words that we used. Not always the people accepted it. And even though in spite of his efforts, it was not accepted. Here's one, two words. One is for pajama. He says, well, if we are working in Hebrew with roots, so to sleep or to snooze or to nod off is num, lanum, is to sleep. 
So he came up with a word for pajama that you wear when you go to sleep, nam nama. <laughs> but guess what? The people did not accept nam nama. And guess what we use until today? Pajama. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you fact, say, I, would not be able, I would not be able to sleep with Nam Nama. <laughs> that's right. And if you say to somebody, give me the Nam Nama, they'll look at you, excuse me, what are you talking about? The second word is a word that is very, very much used. And that is the telephone. Yeah, so what did he do? He says, what does a telephone do that you are in location A and you are able to speak Mm-hmm. with somebody in location B oh, that far away. So, <laughs> so to speak is, sach is to speak. I know, speak. it was not and, accepted. Sach and it was not accepted. The word is sach rachok, which is telephone, that you speak from oh, one place yeah. to another. Never accepted. And it didn't help. You know, it's like they were, like yeah, the Hanukkah. Yeah. yeah, but you know, I, it, it's a, it's normal that not every single word no, would no. be accepted. And I thought he was ingenious. He was a genius. And I salute him. And I'm so grateful that he made all these efforts. And I would like to buy that book that you have about all the words that he, the dictionary yes. of Elias yes. of Yes. And thank you for letting me speak. It was a pleasure yes. participating. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Very good, very good. Actually, along that line, I have a question. Is there someone still updating Hebrew? Such every as- day, every day. Of course. Of course. Every day. Uh, because this is now, uh, we need another Ben Yehuda, uh, somebody like this. Uh, yeah, because because of the technology and because of the connection also uh, uh, with, the, with the world, with each other, it's not like it used to be that uh, this country was closed and this country was closed. And the, uh, mm-hmm. the connection and the technology, there are new words to use all the time. And they, um, unfortunately, I think that some words are really a, uh, for everybody, like uh, because of this technology. Uh, I don't know if there is another word for Zoom in Hebrew, or uh, you know. So it's a yeah, uh, uh, but uh, um, right now the world is more open, and uh, so so that's it. But uh, yeah, but there are new words every time. It, it, it's a need to have new words. There is in Israel a Havada l'anchalat alashon. These are very 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 scholarly people that sit in Jerusalem. And they take care of these creations of new words or ad- adjusting new words. Yes. In fact, I am in constant contact with them. Of course, of course. They, uh, there is no. a, whole, a, a whole group of, um, of Balshanim. Mm-hmm. Uh, that they are, uh, um, so, of course, this doesn't stop. Uh, but it's uh, important, uh, I think, to know the history of it, how it started, and yeah. how it got to where we are now. Yeah. Mama, there's a, uh, Benny would like to uh, say something. There he is. Oh, uh, Benny. Rucham Shalom. Yeah, shalom everybody, Benny. Everybody knows, everybody knows my connection with Rucham. Uh, she knows me when I was a young boy because her father was my teacher. And so two points I want to make. He never spoke to me in first language. He says, Yakum hayeled veyashir <laughs> <laughs> number one. Number two, yeah. autobus is still autobus. I don't know what Father Sean and telephone is still telephone. Yeah. But, but I know, but I know. Mail, mail is mail unless they're talking about SMS or Messer. But the funniest thing is that a very famous music, first of all, I will never, if I can only help it, never miss Rohama's lectures because I learn so much from you, Rahama, all the years, uh, not only because of, of Grisha and Chazanut and our, our, our love for each other, but anyway, when I was at a Hebrew in a college, I befriended a very incredible, significant musicologist, but then Eric Werner. Eric Werner wrote two books about the um, first millennium church and synagogue music. Nobody could understand it because he wrote English like he speaks in German. <laughs> So nobody could read it. But he told me the story that he went to Israel and he learned and wanted to hear speak Hebrew. So he wanted a Flintstone for 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 a cigarette lighter. And he didn't know, 
אבן למצית. So he calls into a מכולת, from a working guy, in, or the Yemen guy in Yerushalayim, and he says, אפשר לקבל הצור חלמיש. <laughs> Only people that speak Hebrew and other Bible, well, הצור חלמיש. צור is the rock, and חלמיש. And the guys are, מטומטם, מה אתה מדבר? He doesn't understand. So, a lot of things. רוחמה, oh, beautiful. I must go because I have another Zoom now. I'm looking for a job so I can start resting a little bit. <laughs> Okay, thank you for being here, Benny. <laughs> okay. Uh, Stephen, you had your hand up. Was there something you wanted to say? Who is there? Stephen. Stephen C. Uh, Kraft. No, uh, Norman has a question. Yeah, but Steve, Stephen's going first. Okay. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, here you are. I'm coming back in a moment. Hi. Ruhama, that was, that was beautiful. It's Stephen oh, here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, just an anecdote. Uh, you're talking about how modern the Hebrew can be and how new words are created. We were just in Israel uh, with Beth David uh, you know, a couple of years ago before this epidemic. And I saw a sign at the city hall at Tel Aviv that said, uh, do not lawless some same kshenohagim et ha'oto. It means don't this word lists some same while you're driving. It's a big sign that was up there at the at the town square. And we didn't know what the word lists some same was, but what it is. Some same. Samech mem samech. The answer is from the English SMS of messaging. messaging. That you should not be texting. What's the Hebrew right, word for right, texting? Right. It's SMS. Samech mem samech. They invented yes. a new word in 2016, list some same, that you should not text yes, while yes. you're doing that. It's I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, this, exactly is what you were saying. this is excellent because this is what somebody else asked before, that right now we have with this technology new, a need for new words, and they don't want you to give text while you are driving. That's uh, right. Exactly. To, to be careful while you're driving. So, right. <laughs> so this, this is exactly what they, when somebody asked before, that right now we need new words. We always need new words, especially, especially with the technology now. Right. Can I, ask, can I ask you one sort of more historical question? And this one has bothered me for a long time. Uh, maybe some of our other scholars here could answer it too. We talk about the actual formation of the Hebrew letters, and you beautifully describe oh, the Aleph, oh, yeah. the Beit, the Gimel, but the text, the text in the Torah that we have now, the text we have in the Hebrew language, does not date from the first temple, it dates from the second temple period. Well, but, but, but the word, but the letters with their mystical Kabbalistic meanings are supposed to be related to the time of the giving of the Torah, right? Yes. Uh, but if yeah, the letters but, were proto-Canaanite, yeah. if they were the ancient Hebrew letters, like you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls with the word for God, they insert the ancient Hebrew letters in the middle of the... A, uh, this is a lecture by itself, I want yeah. to tell you. This is a subject, it's not only sometimes there is difference between the letters. Sometimes there is a sign on top. Sometimes the last letter is a small one. The Aleph is small here. And then, you know, uh, so there is really, and this is a, uh, and, and really, a, uh, I mentioned the Sofrim and the, uh, a, um, uh, the scribes that really, uh, sure. is a, they had every king had a Sofer. Every king in the Tkufat Amlachim, you know, every king had a sofer who wrote the history of, a, of, of this king. And, they, um, and, and then it came in Divrei Ayamim, most of those things that they, that they wrote. Uh, so there is, uh, there is so much a, uh, interpretation uh, to the sign. I don't talk about the Tamim. This is another story, the, the trope. You know, this is another thing, but uh, yeah, but there is a lot. It's a, a lot of things that are. Uh, I was just amazed that that three thousand years ago, they wrote on a cloth. You know how you do this cloth. You know they uh, from an animal and to prepare it for writing on it. My goodness, uh, yeah, to think about all this. So uh, of course, it's a it's an amazing amazing uh, uh, subject. The whole thing. 
I, I could not even speak about everything, but I hope that some was clear and they, uh, and, uh, and you learned something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think there's a few other questions. I don't know where Perry went to. Uh, one from Norman. Yes, you said before Norman, where is he? Norman? <laughs> Norman. This is a, oh, he's, it was, he wrote, the ultra-Orthodox around the world don't adhere to Ben Yehuda. They feel Hebrew is not, okay, Norman, you can oh. continue. Okay, so Rahama, my question is to Marlene, we started to say, as you probably know, the ultra-Orthodox, no matter where they are around the world, all right, don't adhere to Ben Yehuda's concept uh, when he started developing re re the renaissance of the Hebrew language. Uh, when they study Chumash, uh, it's in Hebrew only, and their daily talk is in Yiddish, because they feel they're slating the language when they use Hebrew in daily talk. Can you elaborate uh, on this? Hey, uh, listen, if they don't like it uh, in the daily talk, let them not talk, uh, 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 talk it, you know. It's not a, uh, a um, uh, they still a, uh, they still will use a, a, a if they need a, a, a words like a matzlema, if they, if they speak Hebrew, they want to speak Yiddish, let them speak Yiddish. It's a different, uh, uh, you know, we are not talking, it did not change the Torah. He did not change the, the Orthodox people, when they read the Torah, they read the Torah as it's written, as Moshe wrote it. Moshe wrote the Torah. That's what they want. So they read as Moshe, let them not accept the words that they did. It's not a, uh, I don't see in it any problem. You know, they like better Yiddish, let them speak Yiddish. But they, uh, you know, it's not a, but the Torah, as Moshe wrote it. Oh, it's in Hebrew. They, they, they use it as it is. You also stated during the lecture that uh, the people uh, heard heard the Ten Commandments. Uh, I think you meant they heard it through Moshe. I think that's what you implied. You no, didn't... no, no. God, God said it at the beginning. And then you came. Uh, didn't you remember the Pasuk uh, say that, that the voice of God came over? A, 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 all over and he mentioned it at the beginning. Read it again. I don't remember what a uh, what a uh, verse it is. Did they hear all six hundred and ten commandments? <laughs> uh, um, uh, no, they not all the but, but the, the the ten commandments. They are said that he brought. Yeah. Uh, the midrash said that they that he said all the um, uh, uh, everything. But they, uh, what they heard is probably the ten commandments. Thank you. Yes. There's something uh, from a Jeanette Harris. Is she there? Jeanette Harris? Oh, Jeanette, did you make it at the end? <laughs> I don't know where she is. And I, I don't think she... She was, she was my student 40 years ago. Oh, here it is. Rahama, coming off of Stephen's question, Stephen Kraft. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. You or anyone else here know how and why Rush... Uh, Rashi developed his Hebrew lettering. He's, he's writing the, the, the way that they, they're writing it. Yeah, the way they wrote the, the lettering of the Hebrew alphabet, I guess. What's the, uh, I don't think. Uh, it's been Memphis and I guess that they, uh, that, that they, uh, people wrote in, a, uh, in another way. It's the same word. But they, they wrote it in a different, uh, I, I don't know really. That's okay. Um, and uh, Shoshana wants to say something. Shoshana, unmute. Rose. Okay, Shoshana, Rose. So first of all about Rashi. Rashi used to write his commentary on the same pages where the Hebrew text was. And he really did not, and the students did not want to confuse and have a leakage of his commentary into the text. So they came up with this Ktav Rashi, which are letters that look different than the alphabet. 
That is the reason, because they were written on the sides. But I want, that's not what I wanted to say. I wanted to tell you a funny little anecdote. So Bill, my husband, Ze'ev in Hebrew, we, are in, we go to Israel frequently. And one time we are in Israel and we are standing, we are in a street and there is a sign. And these are the letters. And I want to know who can tell me what the word sounds like. Vav, Vav, Lamed, Vav, Vav. And he can read Torah. And he stood there and he couldn't read that word. What were the letters again? Vav, Vav, Lamed, Vav, Vav. Can anyone decode? <laughs> Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So people are just very uh, 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 stark, uh, strong in, in using the letter in Hebrew. <laughs> right. <than> English. <laughs> Okay, okay, Harry. And, and another anecdote I have is that we are standing on Mount Carmel and the moon was up and it was night and it was a full moon. It was a very moving experience to be so high and the moon was like on our eye level. So Bill, who you know, reads Torah and everything else, we are there with our Israeli families the cousins and everybody else. And he very emotionally and spiritually says, oh, Ezo Levana Yafa. And everybody froze and they started laughing. So he looks around and he doesn't understand. Why are they laughing? He said, Ezo Levana Yafa. Because of course the Israelis don't use the word Levana. They use the word Yareach. So he, he sort of, walked out from the Talmud by saying that, oh, Ezo Levanayafa. <laughs> so there are words that are more used in a modern way than the old oh. words. Yeah. Okay, very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm happy that there was a lot of uh, comments and the... Uh, and there are different opinions about everything. So, and uh, yeah, and that's it. Yeah. Rahama. Yes. Where did Mitsuyan come from? What is the root of Mitsuyan? A uh, Mitsuyan. Tsiyun. I think that they, um, uh, I think that the root of Metsuyan, a, uh, just one second, if you really have a minute. I think we use the word Metsuyan to describe Brahma's presentation today. As usual. <laughs> Rahama, come back. <laughs> Another example of uh, Rahama doing research. Right. <laughs> In live action, wow. may have something for you. Well, let's say, uh, I'm not so sure. I don't like what they said in this dictionary. Uh, yeah, but I promised you, I promised you to look it up from, uh, from where it, from what is the, uh, the Shoresh. Okay. I'm not a, uh, I don't know every word, but uh, I don't like what this uh, dictionary says. Rokama, well, I can wait till the next time we meet. It's okay. Uh, yes, okay. okay. Tiyun is a marker okay. or a bridge. Yeah, from the same Shoresh, but a, uh, 
So Metsuyan is a grade. It's grading something. No, but what is the Shoresh? Tzadik Yud Nun. Tzadik? Tzadik Yod Nun. Letzayen is to, 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 to mark it, to grade it. Yes, yes. I, mean, I understand all the words that come from the same Shoresh. Yeah. yeah. Tzadik Yud Nun. Anyways. But uh, overall, Rachama, I think we have to use the word as I commonly understand it for your presentation today, which was Mitsuyan. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wonderful Excellent. Presentation. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And uh, thank you to everyone for listening in and participating. And it's always wonderful to see everybody. And Very uh, nice. I'll tell you, it's yeah. nice. I can see there were people from Israel and there were people from Florida. I see Tiona Ramark something. I don't know where she is now. Anyways, okay. Anyway, thank you. And thank uh, it was my thank pleasure. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Wonderful. Thank you everyone soon. Be well. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. For and thank you to Rabbi David. He thank left already, you. but he really helped me with all, all these things. Okay. Thanks. With all the technology. Technical help once again. Yeah. Have a great day, everybody. You too. Oh, Thank you so much, Rabbi David. Of course. Very, very, very well done. Take care. Oh, this is my daughter. <laughs> Hi, Denise. I, I wanted to